You know, this might be a sign of me getting older, but I feel like my nostalgia for the baseball that I grew up watching has gotten shortchanged. You are Locked On MLB, your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, let me show you my lower third, where I'm called Sully. I've been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and this is my... Well, my sixth full season here as a host of the Lockdown Podcast Network. You can follow me at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully with Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And if you're listening to us every day, make sure to leave that hashtag. Where is it right now? Every day, Sully. It gives us an idea who is listening to us and maybe who is not. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown MLB. Use code all lowercase lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So I was looking at a couple of, I think it was last week or maybe in the weekend before, Daryl Strawberry got his number retired by the New York Mets. And not long after getting Dwight Gooden's number retired by the Mets. And the, I got to be honest with you, I, I cannot claim to have been a fan of the Daryl Strawberry Dwight Gooden Mets. Anyone who witnessed me on the Curse of the Bambino documentaries on HBO will know a little something about that. However, it brought back some great memories because I'm a child. I was born... In the early 70s, I'm a child of the 80s. I did my growing up in the 80s. My baseball fandom grew in the 80s. Using the rule of seven, 1979, I point to it all the time. That was the first year I really followed baseball year in and year out. But I blossomed as a baseball fan during the 1980s. Just absolutely vivid memories of the 80s, which is a strange decade to have nostalgia for because – it's it's kind of a uh, in the history of baseball. It's kind of a neutral zone. It's not the big flashy color colorful seventies. It's not the return to tradition and steroids nineties. There was no expansion. There were no teams moving around. A lot of the uniforms were kind of dull. The cookie cutter parks everyone playing were starting to get stale. And there was no great dynasty of the 80s. A lot of times we judge our eras based upon the teams that are dominant. There were lots of dominant teams in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. In the 70s, you had the Big Red Machine. You had the Pirates winning several times. You had the Charlie O'Finley A's. You had the Bronx Zoo. There were a lot of teams that put their thumbprint on the 80s. There really wasn't that. Uh, in, in the 70s. There wasn't that in the 80s. The Dodgers were the only team to win multiple World Series titles, and those were two very different teams. And one would argue the 88 Dodgers were one of the worst teams to ever win the World Series, or at least least likely. There weren't dynasties. There weren't you know back-to-back World Series titles. And there were teams that dominated for a burst. One year in Detroit. One year with the 86 Mets. But there wasn't that team that sort of put their thumbprint on the whole decade even some of the most beloved players like strawberry and gooden like dale murphy friend of the podcast in atlanta like fernando valenzuela and oral hershizer in los angeles like kirk gibson and lou whitaker i mean there's so many players who you see were beloved players of their time and yet weren't hall of famers didn't cross over that threshold yes you had the henderson ricky henderson's and the the Ripkins, and there were players who had their Hall of Fame years there, but a lot of the big name stars were players who had these bursts, but not the sense of legends. And so, when you may see, well, why is a Strawberry or a Gooden? He didn't have a big long career. He's not a Hall of Famer, but what he meant to New York fans at that time is is this 
this ripple effect of love and and swagger that came from that Mets team. To this day, anyone my age, go listen to Stacey Gotsoulias on Lockdown Yankees. Anyone my age who's a Yankee fan is a Don Mattingly guy. And you had players who had MVP years like Willie McGee. You know, like Willie Hernandez with the Detroit Tigers. Think of all the, the sort of flash of the pan Cy Young Awards. I'm doing it off the top of my head. You had like the Steve Stones, the Fernando Valenzuela. It's not that it was a flash in the pan, but they're not a Hall of Famer. You know, you have the, the you know, you had the likes of the Lamar Hoyts of the world. Brett Saberhagen winning two Cy Young Awards. Frankie Viola winning a Cy Young Award. Mike Scott. You know, all these players who had these bursts of greatness, but will be difficult to describe that greatness to future generations. Now, one thing that the 80s certainly did have was, I think, the one of the greatest runs of postseason we'll ever see. Some of the most legendary postseason moments came in my formidable years. And this isn't just seeing things through rosy colored glasses, stuff that we bring up all the time. To this day, people will yell Buckner to me, which drives me crazy because the Buckner era was incredibly overrated. The game was already tied when the ball went through his legs. He couldn't have clinched the World Series. Yet. But it was one of the most thrilling and memorable and agonizing games in the history of baseball, if you're a Red Sox fan, where they were one strike away from winning the World Series several times. That whole postseason was one of the great postseasons of all time. You had the Dave Henderson home run against the Angels, and there was a the wild games, you know, walk-off games with the Angels against the Red Sox, the series against the Astros and Mets, which included a walk-off come from behind home run by Lenny Dykstra, the another walk-off hit, that 16-inning marathon. I mean, that's just an unbelievable postseason we had then. What's one of the most repeated uh postseason clips you've ever seen in your life it's got to be the Kirk Gibson home run right that has to be uh, if if not the greatest then one of the greatest moments in baseball history certainly one of the most memorialized one that replayed over and over again that was my nostalgia that was my era of growing up you can't talk about a blown call in a big game without bringing up Don Denkinger in the 1985 uh, World Series and that doesn't even count some of the other, you know, the Jack Clark home run and and the go crazy folks go crazy with the uh, the Cardinals winning there, and the you know the Cubs having that incredible series where they lost to the to the San Diego Padres. And I'll say it, I will say it, the greatest postseason series of all time. Watch it. Watch it on the YouTubes because all the games are there. The 1980 National League Championship Series between the Houston Astros and the Philadelphia Phillies is the greatest postseason series ever played. The last four games, it was a best of five series. The last four games were all extra inning games. It was back and forth with Hall of Famers and superstars on either side. That's the That's my nostalgia. And it's not going to have the same weight as the baby boomers longing for Willie and the Duke and uh, and, uh, and Mickey and all them. And it's not going to have the legendary qualities of the Derek Jeter, you know, Yankees and all that. But I do not feel shortchanged. I will tell you one thing, however. The greatest era of Cy Young pitchers the greatest run of Cy Young pitchers we've ever had in the history of baseball was not the Sandy Koufax and all of them, three and two to Harvey Keene. No. The greatest run we've ever had of Cy Young Awards was not in the 80s, not in the 60s. It was in the 1990s. Bear with me. All right. Spring has sprung and the plants are growing oh did i do that early spring has sprung the plants are growing and it is time to break out the growing cash in your pocket thanks to ibotta this spring flowers are the only thing to be growing 
Avada is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from grocery to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Avada user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping sprint or that flight you've been eyeing or that fancy dinner you've been craving. Join over 50 million users and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including all your favorite grocery stores, Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 for just trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use code LOCKEDONMLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A at the Google Play or App Store and use code LOCKEDONMLB. Now, let's hear from our friends over at FanDuel. You know what FanDuel is? FanDuel is the place to go to now because sports doesn't get better than it is right now. We've got the NBA Finals. We've got the Stanley Cup Finals. We've got baseball going on every single day. And FanDuel is there to help you win, and you can bet on all of it. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on anything from the finals MVP to who's going to get the one out of the park or get that slap shot in there. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel, it's America's number one sports book. Hey, where's your hub for news in sports? Where do you go to? I think you got to make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest sports stories. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. All right, greatest run we've ever had for Cy Young Award winners. Again, maybe I'm being nostalgic, but we're the 1990s. The 1990s were the peak of the steroid era. But while we all experienced gaudy offensive numbers during that decade, we witnessed the greatest Cy Young era in baseball history. Now, you have, we've had some good aces that have come along in the last, uh, you know, in the 2010s. Aces have kind of faded out. And we're starting to see that we don't have the guys going seven, eight innings anymore. That They may have died out with Justin Verlander, Tim Lincecum, Clayton Kershaw, Felix Hernandez, and CeCe Sabathia and Ray Holiday. But in the 80s, you had pitchers like Valenzuela, Saberhagen, Viola, Hershiser, and they put on great, great stretches, but they're never going to get themselves to Cooperstown. People are always going to bring up the 60s where you had the Seavers and the Gibsons and the Fergie Jenkins. But remember, that was a pitcher's era. The mound was higher. Those ballparks were getting bigger. And you you had all sorts of rules that were working in favor of the hit of the pitchers. Now, take a look at this for a second. From 1991 to 2001, the American League Cy Young Award winners were Roger Clemens, uh, Dennis Eckersley, Jack McDowell, David Cohn, Randy Johnson, Pat Henkin, and Pedro Martinez. Okay, McDowell kind of fits in that 80s flash in the pan type. David Cohn is a borderline Hall of Famer. Pat Henkin had that one great year. It should have gone to Andy Pettit. But the National League during that same stretch were Tom Glavin, Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, Pedro Martinez, Randy Johnson. Randy Johnson, Pedro Martinez won in both leagues. Between 91 and 2001, Eckersley's a Hall of Famer, Johnson's a Hall of Famer, Pedro Martinez is a Hall of Famer, Glavin's a Hall of Famer, Maddox is a Hall of Famer, Smoltz is a Hall of Famer, and Clemens should be a Hall of Famer. Okay? We all know why. These, This is a stretch run where almost every one of them are going to be a Hall of Famer. That's 19 out of 22 Cy Young Award winners Handed out to Hall of Famers, if you include Clemens in the bunch. Now, I mean, this is an unbelievable run we had then. And they would think about the era when that group of pitchers were pitching in. 
This was the steroid era. Everything was in favor of the hitters because it was saving the game. By the way, that's one reason why I actually believe Sosa and McGuire belong in the Hall of Fame. Whether they were shooting a gigantic syringe the size of a Louisville slugger, that race saved baseball. And all of baseball has been standing on their inflated shoulders since then. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. The way baseball was stumbling and bumbling and grumbling and lumbling after the strike of 94 and the lockout of 95, they needed something to get the crowds to come back. And it was the two of them. And they did it. And baseball saw smaller stadiums, juiced up players, rules that completely are in favor of the hitters over the pitchers. Suddenly, people come back to the baseball park. Is that fair? Maybe not. Does fair matter? Not really. And so here we go. When you look at that run of pitchers who were facing juiced players, who a bunch of them were facing designated hitters, who were facing you can't throw in the inside pitch, we're going to have the mound is not going to be high. There's no foul territory. Everything. And, and oh, yeah, the players are sh- just injecting horse serum into their body to make them all look like Lou Ferrigno. If you don't know who Lou Ferrigno is, he played the Hulk. Yeah, I'm a child of the 80s. That's where my references are going to go to. And you looked at the stats of those players. I'll put Pedro Martinez's run from 1997, his last year in Montreal, through 2002, his last real healthy season in Boston. I'll throw 2003 at you. But certainly 2002. I'll put that up against any Sandy Koufax year. Did Koufax pitch more innings, strike out more by? Yeah, but look at the era he was pitching in. Look at the era that, that Martinez was pitching in. Where you had middle infielders hitting opposite field home runs. Where 40 home runs didn't put you in the top 10 for the season. Meanwhile, those pitchers in the 60s, Carl Yastrzemski won the batting title one year, batting 301. 25 home runs put you the league, you know, put you amongst the league leaders. The tons of foul territory, the fences were way back. That is the greatest run. Will it ever get the credit for that? Probably not. Probably not, unless there is a market correction. Unless there's a market correction and you start seeing once people my age, once you see the boomers die off and the people who are the gener- you know, a few years ahead of me start to fade away and people my age start to be the one who decides who's in the Hall of Fame through veteran committees and everything like that, you may see the Dwight Evans of the world go in there. You may see the David Cones of the world finally get in there or the Dave Steves who you know, should be in the Hall of Fame and, but haven't been up until this point. And I'd be able to say greatest era of Cy Young winners, the 90s, no questions asked. Say that to someone who grew up in the 60s. They'll look at you like, what are you talking about? You might as well tell them the music was better in the 90s than in the 60s. And you know you can't do that. But then again, as a Gen Xer, uh, you can't tell me that the movies are better because they were always better when I grew up. Hey, let's talk about our friends over at Prize Picks. Do you know what Prize Picks is? I got to be honest with you. I didn't when I started doing this, but Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app. With more than 5 million members, it's the most fun and exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more than or less than on two or more player stats for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. With Prize Picks, you can turn $10 into 1000 in a single game watching your favorite sports this summer. You can make a prize pick lineup in as little as 60 seconds. You just need to pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projection, and you're locked in. Prize picks is America's number one sports app. And you know what? The NBA Finals means more on prize picks. So do the star players. You get boosted payouts on selected basketball stars that you won't find anywhere else. And with baseball more than a third of the way through, there's no better way to cash in on the action with prize picks. Add your favorite players to, from the Diamond to your prize picks lineup all season long, whether it's strikeouts, RBI, first innings run. Take your pick of more than or less than. Add them to your prize picks lineup today. So here's what you got to do. Download the app today. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit matchup to $100. 
That's right. Download the app today. Use the code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks. Pick more. Pick less. Do you know what? It's really that easy. And a reminder that Locked On has created the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's available on the Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channel app. Locked On Sports Day is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channel app. I mentioned this before, but... I'm going to mention it again as I'm talking about nostalgia a little bit. I mentioned this when I did a show where I was walking around Philadelphia and I was looking at the stadium. And I've mentioned this when I talk about the baseball that I grew up watching. And I'll say it. They should have saved one of the concrete donuts. One of the stadiums, the much maligned multi-purpose stadiums, they should have kept one of them. And do upkeep, I'm not saying have it fall apart, but they should have kept one. Whether it was in St. Louis, it's tough to make the argument for Pittsburgh because the new stadium there is so beautiful. And the new stadium in Cincinnati is really great too. And I was at Citizen Bank Ballpark, and that's a really nice ballpark too. But they should have kept one for nostalgic reasons. Now, when they started making the multi-purpose stadiums, and I did a whole episode of multi-purpose stadiums not too long ago, it was a decent idea. You want to have a football team and a baseball team in your city? Why build two stadiums? They're not going to. One will always be empty, so create a stadium where they both can fit in. And it also made things like teams wanting to move. Well, you could move into this stadium. You could fit into there. And with the multi-purpose park, it was more feasible. Now, granted, these were designed in the 60s and 70s, which was not the greatest highlight reel we've ever had for architectural uh, innovation. And everything was was kind of dull and circular, and you couldn't tell the difference between one stadium and the other. And people thumbed their noses at it. And then when Camden Yards showed up, everyone wanted to Camden Yards, and everyone knocked down the donuts, and there you go. The irony is, and I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. The irony is now I have a hard time telling some of the new stadiums apart. Am I in Philadelphia? Am I in Washington? Am I in St. Louis? Those three parks, I have a hard time telling the difference. And yes, we're starting to see these beautiful parks, but after a while, it's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty. Do we have any memories in there? Like the movie Inception, where they said, they're having a dream and we're going to put information into it. And that's how you control the dream. It's not just the stadium. It's the memories in that stadium. If you're a Cincinnati fan, Great American Ballpark, which I think is still the name of the stadium, is a beautiful park and you see the river boats and everything like that. If you're a Cincinnati fan, what are your favorite memories? What are the greatest teams in Reds history? They didn't play in Crosley Field. They didn't play in Great American Ballpark. They played at Riverfront Stadium. That was where you put the Big Red Machine, the greatest team in the history of Cincinnati, one of the greatest teams in the history of baseball. You also, it's where you have the 1990 World Series and their last trip to the League Championship Series. And you know what the funny thing is? I went to a game at Riverfront Stadium with my dad, and I was kind of of holding my nose when I went into it because I was like... Okay, here's one of these concrete donuts. And when I went in there, I got swept up in, say it with me, nostalgia. I could see the highlights of the the 75 World Series. I could see where Pete Rose's hit landed off of Eric Shaw. I could see where Joe Oliver got the hit off of Dennis Eckersley. It was nostalgia there. I felt it. When I went to Pittsburgh, which wasn't as nice a cookie-cutter st- stadium, I could see this was the home of the Steelers and the Clemente Pirates and the We Are Family Pirates and even Barry Bonds, all of that within this donut. How much greatness took place in this one park? And, of course, the vet. Now, of course, there have been very good teams in Citizen Bank Ballpark, the championship in 08, dependent a few years ago, but the vet was the home of the Schmidt 
era Phillies and that crazy team that won in 93 and the, and the Eagles. And there was a sense of it was tough and rough around the edges, but so was Philadelphia. And the great, and, and the stadium I felt they should have kept. The donut I felt they should have kept was St. Louis. Because that was where Gibson played. That is where Pujols played. That is where Ozzie Smith played. That is where Bruce Souter played. They won multiple World Series titles. There had so many great moments there. And the stadium, the new stadium where they won the 06 and the 11 World Series, I can't, there's nothing about it that, that strikes me as unique. And if they had kept that one there, which was the nicest looking one, had the little arches on it, had the grass field on it, if they had kept that one, the great irony would be it would be a unique stadium. You would know instantly which one you were in because there's only one of those left. And if you're a Cardinal fan, yes, you have Sportsman Park, it's nostalgia, but you have the great link from Gibson to Pujols in this ballpark. That's what nostalgia could be. I've talked about this before, but I'm bringing it up again. I'm feeling nostalgic, and they should have kept one. They should have kept one concrete donut to honor a part of baseball history that wasn't the 60s, that wasn't the 40s and 50s and post-war and everything, but that glorious era between 1960 and the end of the 90s. We can be nostalgic for that, too. As you can tell, I've done a few evergreen podcasts, both here and Locked on A's, because I'm on the road, and I want to bank some of these. But starting tomorrow, we're going to be doing some more up-to-date, and uh, we're going to talk about what's been going on in this past weekend and through the first couple of days here and update the power rankings. But for now, talking nostalgic about those eras where people don't tend to get nostalgic for. This has been Locked on MLB. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.